All right, well, hello, Honors Algebra 2. Uh, welcome to the second week of our Statistics and Probability Unit. Um, we're going to be wrapping up the statistics part of that. Um, 11.5 and 11.6 are the last two sections that deal with statistics. And then in 11.7 on up through 11.11, .11, um, those are the probability parts of this unit. Uh, so 11.5, we've done all those data collection, we've analyzed the data displays, we've figured out which is the better measure of center and spread. We're now going to talk about the original design of the study itself. Uh, we're going to talk about the conclusions that can be drawn, as well as some bias that can sometimes take place. Uh, so starting off with a couple of definitions, um, the first thing is inference. Um, we've kind of talked about inference, but in a roundabout way. Um, Inference is the process of using a sample to draw conclusions about a population. Uh, so inference is kind of a key to statistics. It's important. Um, that's kind of what makes statistics what it is. Without inference, you know, statistics is just collecting data and doing nothing with it. Uh, but one problem with that is that sometimes there can lead to bias, which is an error that results in a misrepresentation of a population. Uh, so if for whatever reason, your, your data is biased or skewed in some way, that can sometimes result in some errors with regards to your population. So let's talk about some specific types of bias. Uh, the first of which, under coverage. Uh, in under coverage, not all those in the population have a chance of being selected. Uh, so maybe if you're going to talk about under coverage, maybe you send an email out to all of the students in a, a particular class, well, the problem with that is maybe some of those students didn't have internet access at home. So while you sent out the email, they didn't even have a chance to read the email. That would be an example of under coverage, where not all those in the population had a chance of being selected. Uh, it's similar to, but, but definitely different from non-response. And these two get kind of mixed around a lot of times. So the difference with non-response, which is where not all those selected to participate choose to do so. The difference is, let's go back to the email example, under coverage was saying that there are some people that won't even get the email, that the email will either go to their spam or they won't read it because they don't have internet. Non-response is different. Non-response would be the people that get the email, read the email, and then just choose to delete it. You know, um, kind of like those surveys that get sent out a lot of times that you probably just hit delete in your inbox. That would be an example of non-response. So they are different, so make sure you understand the difference between those two. The third type. Uh, bias that is present uh, is response bias. So with response bias, that's where you get uninformed or incorrect answers given by those in this study. Uh, to give an example of response bias, let's maybe think about doing a study of how students feel about the parking lot situation. If you asked freshmen about that, they might give you some response bias just because as a freshman, you're probably not parking in the lot most likely. You know, you're being dropped off or taken by bus. So while you might give some answers, they might not be really the best answers because you really don't have a true opinion about the matter. That would be an example of response bias. Uh, the last of which is wording bias. And so with wording bias, that's where, just in the way the question is worded, it can tend to lead to biased results. Uh, so that being said, let's kind of take a look at some examples here. I do have a cartoon to show you to you guys um, that kind of illustrates especially response bias. Um, so it says, I'm filling out a reader survey for Chewing Magazine. See, they asked how much money I spend on gum each week. So I wrote $500. For my age, I put 43. And when they asked what my favorite flavor was, I wrote garlic and curry. So obviously they're getting some responses, but probably not the responses they expected based on this survey. So then the other character replies, this magazine should have some amusing ads soon. And to which the, the boy replies, I love messing with data. So definitely an example of response bias there. Okay, so let's take a look at each of these possible sources of bias in a sample survey. We're going to name the type of bias that could result. So example A, the sample is chosen at random from a telephone directory. So if you think about a telephone directory, not very many people are going to have their telephones in the directory. I would see this as being under coverage. Now, in addition to that, I could also maybe see one more. Maybe you can think of which one that would be, which is that even if they did sample at random from the telephone directory, they might not have everyone answer the phone. So I could also maybe see this as non-response. Uh, but I would definitely more so see this as under coverage. I think that's the one that's more apparent in the design of this survey. So B, some people cannot be contacted in five calls. In other words, 
they've been top contacting people, they just aren't responding. So to me, that would be non-response. I could maybe see an argument for under coverage, but I think non-response would be the better option here. All right, for C, interviewers choose people walking by on the sidewalk to interview. So in this case, you're only interviewing the people that are walking by on the sidewalk. You're not necessarily interviewing anyone that's driving by or riding a bike or anything like that. I would see that as being under coverage. Okay, cool. So another example here for us to look at. So a survey paid for by the makers of disposable diapers found that 84% of the sample opposed banning disposable diapers. Here's the actual question that they asked. It is estimated that disposable diapers account for less than 2% of the trash in today's landfills. In contrast, beverage containers, third class mail, and yard waste are estimated to account for about 21% of the trash in landfills. Given this, in your opinion, would it be fair to ban disposable diapers? Explain how the wording of this question could result in bias. So this is where we're talking about wording bias, and it already kind of told us that. So let's talk about how that is apparent in this um, example. Uh, so I think the, the biggest thing on this is their comparison to the other containers. Uh, so the comparison to other waste, I think is where this question becomes kind of a little bit unfair. Um, so the direction of this bias would definitely be against the ban on diapers which should be kind of a no-brainer. You know, it's a survey that's being paid for by makers of disposable diapers. So clearly they're going to want the data to show that people are against a ban on disposable diapers. And to do that, obviously that's where they compared it to other ways. That's where the wording bias came into play in this particular scenario. All right. So in addition to talking about the bias, as well as kind of all of the other things that are involved in a survey and the questions and the wording of it, we're also going to talk about some ways that graphs can be made to be misleading. Uh, so some common ways to make a graph misleading. Um, 3D images are oftentimes used, um, but there's a problem with 3D images in that they don't have the necessary, or they sometimes over-exaggerate the area of a bar in a bar graph just because of the way that they have to make the 3D image proportional. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Um, if they don't have the axes labeled, so not labeling your axes or even the title of the graph can definitely make it misleading. Um, so that's another thing that you kind of have to watch out for. Uh, some other things to watch out for is not starting at zero. And so if they don't start the graph at zero, that's what's called truncating the graph. And when that happens, it can definitely lead to some misleading graphs. Um, and then there's obviously some of the other biases and stuff that can creep their way in. But I would say those are kind of the big things, and those are going to be the things that we'll see examples of in just a moment. Okay, so let's take a look at the following graph. So I took this from um, a advertisement for DirecTV. Um, so it says DirecTV stops the competition. It says DirecTV has 95 of your favorite HD channels. Um, and then it's got a list of those channels, USA, CNBC, Sci-Fi, um, and then another one that's kind of hard to see there. It looks like they're all HD channels, which are always the better ones to watch. Um, but then it's also got Dish Network, where it has 81, but not really. They count 24 part-time channels, and then cable with only 56, which is only in a few major cities. Uh, so let's talk about how this graph can be a little bit misleading. Um, a few things that I would note, first of all, is they're kind of using a, a way of wording bias when they're including these um, labels down here, but also notice that there are no labels. So there's no labels on the x-axis, there's no labels on the y-axis, which makes things very misleading, especially when you think about the heights of these. If you think about how 95 is up here and 85 or 81 is right here, that almost makes it look like 81 is only a little bit more than half of 95. And that 56 is almost as close to 81 as it is to 95. Um, so I think that that would be another thing that would make this graph misleading is not having those labels, especially for the vertical axis, but also the horizontal axis. Notice that they made DirecTV a much bigger section, whereas Dish Network and Cable were roughly the same, uh, which makes DirecTV have a much larger area so the area is not consistent 
based on the number of channels. So, obviously a lot wrong with this graph. You can understand why it's misleading though, because DirecTV is trying to get you to come to their company. Um, so it's not as if they made this graph to make it a um, nice graph for a truly statistic-based graph. Um, they were trying to intentionally mislead you. Okay, let's take a look at another example. So how would this graph be misleading? So we're told that we're looking at the number of buyers for it looks like uh, three different types of previous computer where they've got none, Windows, and Macintosh. Uh, so the first thing that we've already kind of mentioned is that 3D images can make a graph very misleading. Um, part of that is because if you're looking at it with a 3D image, one thing would be, where's the height? Is this the height or is this the height? Uh, that's two totally different numbers. You're looking at maybe 310 versus 350. Um, so a difference of 40 just based on what the height is. Uh, the other thing would be with the 3D images, notice that the width is not consistent with each of these. Uh, so they are not the same area for each of the different bars, which obviously is also misleading. If they even tried to do that, I mean, they'd have to really scrunch this piece together and it's not going to really look the way it's supposed to if it's kind of scrunched all together to make it skinnier to make the areas equal. So with 3D images, you're not going to be able to get the areas to match up. Um, some other stuff that might be kind of misleading, just from the way the graph was made, and this is more of the design bias than the wording bias, because there's really not any words, but if you look at what type of computer this looks like, to me, it looks a lot like a Macintosh computer. Now, obviously, they changed the symbol here, but you can pretty clearly tell that they're trying to make it look like a Macintosh computer, uh, not necessarily like a Windows or a, a non-Windows or Macintosh computer. So... One more here for us to look at. There are two possible bar graphs. Um, so they, what they've done here is they've taken the data from this previous example and they've made two different bar graphs out of it. Um, which one could we consider to be deceptive and why? Um, so taking a look at these, they look like pretty much the same graph. Um, there's one key difference though. So you might look for it first and then I'm going to point it out for you. And the one key difference is where the graphs start. Notice that the graph on the left starts at zero, the graph on the right starts at 10. So while it looks like on the graph on the right, the PC is very low, um, in which it is, but it's more than 10, and you can see how much more clear that is over here on this graph on the left. So I would say the graph on the right is more misleading. And I would say the reason for that, I'm gonna use the technical term, um, which is that it's been truncated. And remember, truncated just means that it did not start at zero. All right, so that's all I've got for you, 11.5. There's homework for this on Big Ideas Math. And then this will be the first section that's covered on this Friday's quiz, which will be quiz number 18. So if you guys have any questions, make sure to let me know. Remember, office hours are 10.30 to 11.30 each day. And if there's any questions that you have and are unable to get to office hours for, um, feel free to email me, and I can always work through those and make a video and send that out to the entire class. So that being said, have a good day, everyone, and I will talk to you next time.